when we first started discussing unmarketing real estate the podcast our whole concept or the whole idea in our head was to bring out more stories from real estate from real estate marketing which help our viewers connect between the evolution that the real estate marketing has gone through and the future that is moving to if there was ever a guest who could have woven this story in in a single interview it has to be mr cj matthews vice president marketing and pr at the nahal group he's an ex guest join us as he shares very candidly his his entire journey in real estate and stories and anecdotes insightful anecdotes into how the medium of communication between the real estate stakeholders and their customers changed over the course of the last 10 15 years and where the technology is actually taking us be back with you hi cj thank you so much for joining us hi hi dig vijay thank you so much for having us uh, and having me on the show um, looking forward to uh, a nice chat over the next 30 minutes of course of course same same here same here yeah so i want to start off with your journey in real estate you uh, started in real estate in 2005 and since then you have been in some of the most prestigious real estate organizations rajesh life spaces uh, asher group and and now at nahar so i want to start off with how did you come about joining real estate and how has this journey been for you well it was it wasn't one of those plotted journeys you know where i decided okay now i want to jump on the real estate time dragon so to come and file a little part of my personal journey at that point was i just got back to bombay to india in fact after a break of uh 3 odd years and okay. things a lot in the in the 3 years that i was away you know, india shining story had just kicked off uh, and there was mm-hmm. a lot of positivity in the market uh everybody was doing well you know professionally career in their own careers companies yeah. were talking fantastic numbers in terms of you know profit growth and stuff like that and uh, i was looking for an opportunity where i felt that i needed to start at the grassroots level if i might say that uh, mm-hmm. because i wanted to learn the city as well uh, i was yeah. a little bit of stranger to the city back in 2005 okay. uh, okay. and so i said i wanted an opportunity to kind of learn uh what the city is about learn all the cultures that exist and you know and and, uh, and also learn the city even geographically i didn't know that <laughs> the distance between burgli to bandra or bandra to thane even very well back in those days uh okay. so after uh, after going through a whole set of interviews with with multiple organizations from multiple industries uh i got my first call from rustamji so i started off yeah. my journey back in 2005 yeah and um, i had a this lovely two part interview with the you know with the gentleman that still is still part of the rustamji story uh-huh. and, uh and they were looking for at that point they were looking for somebody to join a brand new team called the customer relations okay as part of that journey uh, as part of that interview sorry as part of that interview uh, you know the person who was taking my interview felt that i could do well with leading the team Uh, and so, right so that's how that uh, you know i joined i think about a couple of days later uh-huh. and set out to create uh, what was a very unique concept in terms of customer relations yeah uh, in way back then um and uh, set up the people the processes the capacities capabilities of the entire team the function um eventually a year later we we were showing our own set of fantastic numbers uh, for mm-hmm. you know the areas and the responsibility areas that were assigned to us we were already a team of five people and um, okay. after taking care of one critical responsibility over nine months we then moved into um you know building an avenue for referral business uh yeah. for Rustamji back and that also yeah. went off very well like it was a, a kind of an untapped area at that point you know at least from a organized approach in terms of talking yeah. about referral yeah you know getting people to to uh, voluntarily bring in their friends their family their associates into larger projects smaller projects that Rustamji had to offer back then But yeah, yeah, later an interesting conversation happened in the office, which I can't share too much here. And, and <laughs> I was asked to start leading marketing. This okay. Was, uh, in 2006, if I if memory serves me right, and uh, since then there's there's been no 
back. So of the 17 years, 18 years that I've been in the industry, I've spent 17 years uh, taking care of marketing functions. Uh, it has been a fantastic journey uh, being part of real estate. Yeah. And the, the, both the organizations and the leaders that have that yeah. helped me uh, through this, this entire journey. Um, so that's that's how I joined real estate. I mean, it was it long story short. It was a little bit of a fluke. <laughs> no, to be honest, this is one of the most amazing answers that I've I've heard of this uh, for this for this particular question. It sounds very serendipitous of how you joined real estate and ended up ended up in marketing. Now you have been in this uh, the marketing. Uh, let's say the paradigm for real estate for 17, 18 years, as, as you uh, pointed out, how have you seen this landscape change uh, more so in the past decade? Wow. Uh, so marketing, uh, I, I, let's just say, I think back in 2005, 2006, marketing was largely called just advertising, uh, okay. you know, and, and today we kind of, academic definition that we would give to advertising versus a larger scope or a larger ecosystem that comes under the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, real estate was just waking up to a lot of new theoretical uh, theories rather, sorry, theories of yeah. what you know, advertising could mean and, and people were starting paying attention to what marketing as a larger function, creation okay. of that ecosystem, putting, pulling in resources and, and people and expertise. Um, mm-hmm. That brink of change, that brink of revolution was just happening between 2005 yeah. and 2005. Okay. Obviously, this is just an opinion that I, my own exposure uh, yeah. created this kind of uh, opinion back then. So, in, 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 the, in the typical definition of advertising, those days it was largely, when the reserve was right again, print advertising. You know, uh, yeah. whatever broadsheets existed at that point of time. Uh, obviously, you know, the largest English newspaper work was taking the largest share of voice from real estate and terms of advertising. Two yep. new releases were introduced into the market, I think it was in 2005. Um, okay. And, and so suddenly there was an interesting um, mix or an interesting dynamic in terms of being uh-huh. able to do different types of readers, um, you know, across the, across the landscape of potential customers, right? Um, yeah. Whether it was the largest English daily at that point of time and its yeah. you know, set of loyal subscribers, mm-hmm. uh, two new dailies brought in a whole new set of readers. You know. Okay. Uh, and as as each of these companies started, at, you know, competing with each other, we could we could as as advertisers uh, suddenly see that <clears throat> there are unique readers to each daily, and uh, it made sense to be able to communicate to them kind of exclusively uh, okay. from there uh, i mean you know a lot of it is is like documented history in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. True. i think uh, from print uh, the next thing that was uh, pretty large in terms of uh, you know marketing rupees was outdoor uh, yeah. for a few years uh, the dot com or the internet phase where, where the first move for a lot of real estate developers was just setting up their own website. I think it came uh, say about 2008, 2009. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's when you suddenly saw a, a large, much larger number of developers, uh, you know, posting their own uh, presence on the world wide web by uh-huh. publishing their own websites and corporate websites. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so once once everybody's eyes open to the internet, what that could uh-huh. do for companies locally and you know across the continent, because we've got multiple NRI hubs across Asia to start with, uh, yeah. and then finally what it can do for you globally. I think a lot changed between the years of 2008 and 2010 uh, yeah. for real estate. Uh, that that those particular years also saw a kind of with the, the famous recession uh, that yeah. you know the prime recession yeah. that everybody yeah, yeah. Uh, was what 2007 2008 um, so yeah. that also gave us spurt for everybody uh, I think a lot of my counterparts a lot of uh, promoters who led the sales and marketing function to look out for additional avenues to be able to reach their target of audiences right? yeah uh, so yeah. 
by 2010 we were looking at what well, we were looking at print outdoor radio uh, started to, you know collecting money from real estate developers and speed doing mm-hmm. uh, plentiful opportunities television yeah. jumped in um, yeah. and then everything that suddenly the the, the, well, the internet opened up its own kind of several gates you know several doors and yeah, yeah. So yeah yeah sms marketing email marketing uh, you know and uh, those things started getting a lot of popularity so it was everybody was you know media companies real estate companies media buying agencies everybody was and obviously creative partners to this entire ecosystem one of your creative agencies all yeah. these guys were sitting down and working together to 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 say things differently to say yeah. things more concisely to you know to probably yeah. individual uh, you know target audiences and yeah. to use as many of the available opportunities to say that uh, i think post 2010 uh, is when the last decade 2010 to 2020 uh, inclusive of all of the, the you know the, the difficult scenarios that the entire industry has faced whether it is nationally globally etc etc um the biggest evolution today is obviously digital, right and yeah there was a point in time where you know 50% 60% of the annual marketing budget or the projects budget for lead generation was devoted to print today i think it's safe to assume that there is a large number of players who are saying i'm putting 40% of my spend on digital and uh-huh. i think It, it's it's safe to say today that you know digital rules the roost so yes so in in the time that uh, as as you mentioned in your responses uh, response for the last question that so many times evolution has happened and a new medium of interacting with the customers has come out right so in in that in this long journey that you have been uh, doing the marketing for the real estate could you point out some of the most impressing impressive campaigns uh, which really changed the way uh, real estate interacted with its customers okay uh, i think uh, so a dichotomy that i need to establish right at the beginning is that largely all of marketing that has evolved over the last decade or so uh, can be broken into two parts mm-hmm. real estate firms that have spent money on their brand yeah and the second part being real estate firms that have spent money on the project yeah so uh, there was i think uh, a good part between 2010 to 2015 if, uh, mm-hmm. i remember my history correctly where a substantial no- large number of brands were putting money a substantial number of brands were putting money behind their brands you know okay. whether it was putting money behind the uh, equestrian events at malakshmi race course yeah doing branding events at some uh, you know some of the, the fanciest five star and hospitality properties across this city across across india for that matter you know yeah yeah and, and uh, putting money in in uh, into world events like terex stocks uh, mm-hmm. you saw a lot of money being put into where people wanted their brand to be right okay and i told okay. you the name that they yeah. want the consumer of today to recognize them for Yeah. or even for some brands to be able to spend money with let's say a, a potentially younger consumer younger set of the consumer who may okay. in the next 3 7 years end up coming to a place where they want to do transact in real estate so you know you leave okay. a message they yeah and and then eventually yeah. you know you establish some kind of relatability with that kind of a younger subset of consumers keep in yeah. touch with them for multiple reasons and then when they're ready to kind of make their first uh you know real estate purchase or or investment they they kind of think of you first right um so i'm i i really don't want to take brand names at this point of time but you know for all the brands that may end up seeing this video or listening to this podcast yeah. they will they'll probably recognize themselves from some of the examples like they were earlier okay right yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of project marketing i think the biggest evolution that i have seen in the last decade and a half is people uh, or marketers advertisers not talking about just the four walls of your home right okay yeah so the the number one signal is 
you know, we were reacting to our customers. What our customers wanted. We were having a project yeah. today. And I was selling X, Y, Z inventory. I was creating something for the customer of today. While I was interacting mm-hmm. with that customer, I realized that they wanted something else also. So my next mm-hmm. project, I was involving my product. So I was kind of being reactive uh, as a as a developer. I was being reactive to yeah. my customers with the product that I had today, and then I started building something for tomorrow. Okay. So consumer behavior today, or, or customer preferences, like we used to call them uh, uh, earlier. Yeah. So today, consumer behavior ends up influencing a lot of the marketing and advertising and um, so you see advertising that has evolved from say uh, you know talking about very specific features within just your home to whatever yeah. is outside of your home to what yeah. is inside your single building project or your multi building project or your township yeah. or your gate we are yeah. talking about life quality of life that is yeah. the single biggest portion of product advertising and, okay. uh, and I think it's it's going to be more further. Uh, there might be people who understand today that you know our consumers who eventually transact with us in real estate are getting heavily influenced by mm-hmm. their own brands in other industries. You know whether so, it is uh, you know tech brands uh, or with FMCG brands, whether it's aspirational brands. Their interactions with all of those brands, uh, a lot of them international and, and a few of them Indian, uh-huh. they're bringing those experiences back into real estate and saying, listen, I kind of want this. I kind of expect this. So the other thing that's happened in product marketing is your customer experience that's, uh, that's yeah. that has occurred dramatically at the uh-huh. actual project site offices. I've seen some remarkable plans and some remarkable turnaround in execution of what developers want to provide their customers at a project site office or a sales office. Uh, okay. And that's also evolving. Thanks to VR and AR, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed, uh, especially since 2019 and what 2020 and 2021 taught us. Um, yeah. That AR and VR has picked up dramatically. I think we should see a, a little bit of a boom, even though we are behind in terms of the <laughs> technological revolution. We're a little yeah. bit behind, but yeah, you, we should see a boom uh, in the next. I mean, it's already ongoing, so to speak. You know, in yeah. terms of people putting money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think more yeah. technological revolution should be expected. Yeah, I think I should make you the host of our marketing because this is the insight that we wanted to bring out. <laughs> How technology is changing the landscape in a way, as you correctly pointed out, you started off with dividing into two parts uh, as to how the project is to be promoted and how the brand is to be promoted. And that's exactly uh, the the kind of awareness that we want to bring out through these talks as to where the marketing is going in, in future and how technologies are impacting. So the next question that I want to come to is uh, data analytics. Right. So data analytics, uh, you you might have seen it yourself heading or leading the marketing uh, strategies and the marketing teams for such a long time. How real estate is warming up to the idea of data more and more. Right. So in today's day and time, in in your role um, at, at Nahar, how are you? Uh, what are the three most important data metrics for you, and how you're integrating, let's say, data analytics as a part of your value chain? Okay. At the onset. Uh... I like to admit that you know it's 2022 and and the kind of theoretical knowledge I should have on big data analytics or data analytics I don't have. Uh, I I hope to upgrade myself uh, because it is the need of the hour. Uh, it has been happening in its own way over the years. You know, sales and marketing yeah. heads put their heads together and say, okay. This is the bunch of customers that came. This is the bunch of leads that came. This is what we know about our leads. This is what we know about yeah. our customers. And so we've yeah. been doing, you know, in a, in a kind yeah. of semi-professional manner uh, for a large part without the you know, help of any uh, specific tools that that take care of uh, that take care of uh, data analytics or help you mm-hmm. drive the best kind of analytics from the data that you're putting in the system. So yeah. Having said that, I think. Uh, Three things that I could consider as the top priority today is uh, one is what part of their journey did they consider my product, right? Okay. Uh, am I first priority or my second priority, third priority? 
was like okay forget yeah. the word priority right in terms of just in, in terms of how did you get your information organically am yeah. i project yeah. number 5 or my project number 9 was i project number 3 you know and i just want to yeah. understand in terms of your search journey where did you did you did you get to know about mahar or when okay. what helped you kind of also part b of that question is what in our community can help you say that okay i want to learn more about this project of mahar yeah. right yeah. so that, yeah. so like priority 1 and priority 2 to form yeah. the inter yeah. uh, priority number 3 i think uh, and most typically at this point is keeping an eye on uh, how uh, the number of customers that are comfortable talking about their uh, budgets Uh, okay. The reason for that is to to and if you keep an eye on that across months and years, uh, you should be able to see, uh, you know, whatever your data shows you in terms of how mm-hmm. does how much is that budget actually evolving across okay. the number of customers you see, and yeah. uh, are your products today and both tomorrow yeah. in line with the with that growing pattern or stagnant pattern of people's budgets or consumers budgets yes. um yeah. because you know you can build in real estate in bombay enjoys today enjoys mm-hmm. a significant amount of demand but there was yeah. always this confidence and maybe even over confidence that you know we can build anything and it will sell yeah that has not been the case for the last 7 years you know it, it's changed from seller's market to buyer's market right yeah. and now you have to be sure that what you're building in terms of what covers into those four walls especially with regards to residential real estate um yeah makes perfect value propositional sense to uh-huh. because you want to enjoy good sales velocity right as as a developer yeah. of a product you have Uh, you know obligations and commitments to maintain a good sales velocity and you can yeah. only one of the most powerful strengths you can imbibe to make sure that you have a good sales velocity is to make sure that your product is just positioned right yeah and so understanding I mean, and probably made it sound simpler than it is by saying keeping an eye on budget as obviously a series of questions after that uh, but yeah. these are the top two three things that i look at uh, that i want to keep looking at Uh, it's mm-hmm. just short to mid term in terms of uh, in terms of data analytics and that i think will help us in bettering our numbers in terms of lead generation amazing amazing thank you so much for that uh in fact i want to switch to uh from here i want to switch to something that you uh touched upon earlier uh in in your response for the marketing landscape change uh the role of technology you did uh, share your insights about vr ar and how they impacted during the post covid uh, phase when there was a lockdown and people were not able to do physical site visits yes. now i want to touch upon the other let's say deep technologies which have come into real estate quite a bit uh, or at least are are in the popular uh, let's say know how these days uh, for example i want to start off with artificial intelligence now artificial intelligence as we already know the marketing platforms deploy for for us when we are doing the marketing but in terms of other aspects where have you seen or where do you see it bringing a much bigger impact and when do you see it becoming let's say much more mainstream um uh, okay so artificial intelligence uh, as as a phenomena or as an, on its own i think um we should go, we should see it go mainstream for multiple facets of real estate not just the sales marketing right yeah, because yeah. technology is it has to be imbibed across the length and width of a company and you need True. to deploy the best technology uh, yeah in construction you need to deploy good technology with regards to procurement with regards to maintaining of finance and accounts department so it is it, it you know it has to go across the board now i yeah. think um, in in terms of sales and marketing uh, in terms of how we empower ourselves uh, in in a couple of facets right how do we be how do we empower ourselves to predict uh, what our customer needs wants is going to ask uh, artificial okay. intelligence 
play a role there to be able to us to help us prepare better for those answers to be more timely with those answers or the content pieces yeah. that deliver to the customers yeah. so in the sales and marketing bit i think um, a conservative guess for artificial intelligence to go mainstream is about 2 years okay uh, i think for the rest of the departments across a real estate developer uh, you know i think a window of 5 years okay so that you know it, artificial intelligence is helping the whole company you know the whole yeah, yeah, yeah. and all these yeah. departments because if, at the end of the day 10 departments 30 departments uh, in, in, you know in terms of how you organize your company all of them are, are facilitating pretty much one thing make mm-hmm. a space for a potential customer Right. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Commercial healthcare, whatever it is. So everybody is working mm-hmm. towards that one end goal. So uh, it would seem kind of lopsided to have just the sales and marketing function working on artificial intelligence and nobody else, you know, trying to take yeah, advantage yeah, yeah. of that technology. That is. True. So like, for for sales marketing perspective, two years to see a lot more adaptation of artificial intelligence in terms of uh, inter department or, or yeah, yeah. you know. Business to client, business to consumer relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Across the company, maybe five years. Okay, this is quite interesting because two to five years, quite honestly, is is not a very long time scale, right? It's 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 supposed to have an impact very very soon, which is which is totally amazing. Uh, I exactly. <laughs> so, uh, from artificial intelligence, I want to shift to one of the more, let's say. non tangible technology which is still being explored to a larger extent uh, called blockchain right so smart contracts we have seen some of our state governments engaging with respect to smart contracts what's your view on it and how do you see it do you see it becoming a reality in real estate or what's your view on it yeah see i think if almost any technological revolution today uh, whether you talk about smart contracts and everything else that you know or let's say a more popular way of calling that is the metaverse you know everybody is yeah, yeah. metaverse that's exactly. what talk dabbling in cryptocurrencies and non fungible yeah. tokens and what not yeah. so every technology uh, that you know whether it starts b2b and then goes b2c or vice versa yeah. eventually has a rub off on every walk of the line right it's it's kind okay. of rhetoric to say that but i'm going to just say that um so smart contracts i think uh, i i i'm kind of sure will will play a role in, in about 3 4 years uh, in terms of okay. adaptation right? okay. i think it will play a role in um, especially for people looking to buy real estate in remote locations yeah i yeah. think that will probably be the first adaptation of smart contracts for real estate yeah. you know yeah. uh, you know and are i trying to buy you know buy real estate in, in in some town maybe a little town or a tier 3 city somewhere you know deep in, in india or in what yeah, yeah. it could be in a metro that could yeah. be one of the first adaptation of smart contract you know helping them to customers who are living remotely away from the actual real estate offering making yeah. sure that they are uh, they're confident about their purchase yeah, yeah. it makes a lot of sense uh, it it makes a lot sorry sorry to interrupt you but i wanted to say it makes a lot of sense in terms of legal ownership and those kind of things are the benchmark which these uh, technologies are setting up it makes a lot of sense the use case that you have mentioned yeah. and and i think the interesting thing the most unique thing rather of smart contracts and at least what i have learned about it is that that contract exists in multiple nodes yeah right so it's not like a paper based document today if i had if i unfortunately had a fire at my home or 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 a, a robbery at my home and somebody went into yeah. my little home and picked up all of my papers and lost what a smart contract i can always always kind of you know, retrace it and and yeah. multiple copies and because it it ex- exists in so many nodes it it's it's a certified true copy as like how we try to say about you know paperwork these days So I think that's mm-hmm. probably going to be the one of the first adaptations. And I also have this thing that this is going to be one of those technological revolutions that our customer will ask of us before we provide. I, 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 that I, it's in its own way, it's a little exciting to be able to be pushed yeah, yeah. by a customer to do something. But I think that might happen. It's possible. Amazing, amazing. 
So I want to take a slight detour from the technology talk to to uh, channel partners or brokers, right? So one of the questions that we pose to every guest is is on brokers as to how important they are uh, to the real estate real estate ecosystem in your organizations or in general, and what do you think of the position of startups such as No Broker, which to be honest publicly have aligned themselves as to be uh, standing. opposite or against the broker community um, privately what they say is is not something that we are aware of but what do you think of their position okay uh, to answer part one of the question uh, especially in bombay uh, our friends in the channel partner community will have been has been is currently and will continue to be a very very significant part of the real estate transaction and this yeah. cuts across asset classes it cuts across private okay. secondary markets uh, it cuts across land deals it cuts across a lot of things right um, mm-hmm. i think whether you look at developer or you look at different stakeholders that, that yeah. you know they're doing business through a channel partner or prefer to doing business through a channel partner it's the investment of trust yeah. you have Uh, another human being other than the seller to yeah. kind of play, to place your trust in he is kind of reaffirming yeah. your you know your purchase decision he is reaffirming the knowledge you are trying to imbibe for the type of transaction you are doing yeah uh, i mean the thumb rule so or not thumb rule rather that a given statistic of bombay real estate transactions actual sales yeah, especially in the primary market is that what i think 80 85% of developers can confidently say that anything between 60% about 60% of their transactions eventually gets closed because the channel partner with them right and okay. the most important evolution that i want to give kudos to the channel partner fraternity number number two actually uh, number one is the fact that a lot of them are organizing themselves you know yeah yeah they have they between rera and their own initiative they're organizing themselves they're formalizing themselves they're making sure that they have yeah. all the paperwork in place to safeguard their you know their legal rights and and yeah. in fact also their legal identity right uh, and the second part is is this is this growing number of channel partner firms and individuals who are investing in technology uh, yeah. i think that is a very very reassuring sign There are times where developers and CPs end up having a little bit of a debate on an argument uh, in terms of yeah. IPs, and, but that's okay. It's, it's part of the growing process, you know. It's part of the, it's part of uh, the evolution that we are all going through. I mean, there's a lot of yeah, yeah. as developers and channel partners we're learning uh, together. Uh, but yeah, these are two things that I really want to give kudos to to the channel partner community, and uh, for people who. who See, there is unfortunately, uh, you know, across all of these asset classes and types of transactions that go, there are some very, very difficult stories where uh, stakeholders of a particular transaction have taken advantage, uh, or, or being disruptive, or being, uh, you know, or maybe even engaged in illegal kind of transactions. Now, because of that, uh, there is no. particular group of trans stakeholders that does not have uh, you know some amount of negative pr around them yeah it's like how yeah. back in the 80s all the developers were looked like the villain in you know in a bollywood <laughs> every bollywood movie had a villain that was a, de- a builder right so it it can stem from that whether it was pop yeah. culture or otherwise there is no yeah. stakeholder in our ecosystem that is devoid of negative pr Having said that, yeah. you know there are going to be people who says that okay, let's take this one point and see if we can create a business around that one point, which yeah. is you know the dot com that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm not, I can't say much for their business and, and yeah. how it, and how well they're doing, uh, but see, it's an opportunity, right? Um, yeah. yeah, there is going to be opportunities which may be good for me and for you. But yeah. it may not work for somebody else. It might be a conflict of interest. It might be an ethical debate. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, it's every every business has that, 
you know every True. business has yeah. Yeah. organization of building spaces and developing real estate also has its uh, you know ethical issues and and uh, Uh, he's stepping on my toes. I'm stepping on your toes. All that kind of conflict of interest and, and yeah, yeah. happen. So I can't speak for one particular firm who said that okay, I want to do business in a certain manner. Yeah. Uh, if he sees an opportunity and he is trying to create, a, you know, a profit for himself from that. Okay. All the best to them. <laughs> That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> But uh, ethically speaking, uh, that I mean, in the truest sense of ethics, uh, I I don't see uh, a grave problem with what one operator is doing. Uh, you know, it's not like that particular opportunity is is kind of flourishing. Uh, you know, oh, true. And, uh, and as as future entrepreneurs, to anybody who might be watching this. As long as you're you're clear in your head in your heart about the ethics of your business and, and the yeah. transaction you want to run, go for it. Amazing.